What would you say if I told you, my son's survival depends on you? How would you live if I said, this is an emergency and you're the one who can save him? What would you tell your child if you knew what you taught them today could mean the difference between my child living to age 24 or age 94? I have a brother who was adopted from Korea. My husband has two sisters from India. So when we decided to adopt from Uganda after having two biological children, I thought I knew what it meant to raise a child of another race. But I was not prepared for what it would mean to be the mother of a black boy, then a black girl. Not even the first idea. Before the red Ugandan dirt dusted my feet and seeped into my pores, before the court date where the judge set down his glasses and said, here is where I have a problem, before weaving through traffic on a motorcycle taxi with a baby strapped to my back, before I understood that love is not enough, America fashioned me a cape. It was a modest, subtle thing stitched together out of religious language and noble intentions, but woven in was the dark lie of a white savior. I wore it into the slum where you were born, tiptoeing on wood planks over raw sewage, and it was like I was on holy ground. The smiles and shouts of joy at your arrival, they paraded you through the maze of shacks and lean-tos like a favored son returning home. You were loved there. I learned of your tribe, the kingdom of Buganda, where you were a prince among princes, a black boy set in a constellation of other black boys like dark stars twinkling on a backdrop of blinding color. And I meant to take you from this place back home to America, the very same land that stole, enslaved, fought, freed, imprisons, and oppresses your African brothers and sisters. My throat tight, I tugged at my cape and found it threadbare and disintegrating. The last bit of unraveled thread wrapped like a hand around my neck. What exactly was I saving you from? A year after we brought our son home, 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was murdered. I felt like scales fell from my eyes as I looked at my own little black boy, not even two years old then, and imagined him older, walking home from the convenience store a few blocks away and the neighbors mistaking him for a trespasser, a threat, or a thug. Who would they decide he is? By the time we brought home our daughter a year later, I was deep into learning about my own white privilege, privilege that protects me from the unjust disadvantages experienced by people of color every day. I was beginning to get the first idea, but I still have a lot to learn. I study you like an explorer studies what's just off the edge of the map. I trace your face, learning its topography, smiling at each discovery, how your ebony has depths of blue, how even your eyelashes curl in kink, how quickly your skin drinks in shea butter and coconut oil. And girl, your hair. I ask advice and watch videos, buy products and pintail combs, barrettes and bollies, and will these white fingers to conform to your curl pattern. I learn that your hair is your crown, and I set beads in it like jewels. I learn there are some who would feel uncomfortable to witness your hair big and proud just the way it grows out of your head, and rules might be put in place to protect weak white eyes from the weight of your glory, to cut you off from your power and deny you access to your roots. So I study. I chart the fault lines in history, memorize the patterns of your oppression, and like the sojourners in the Underground Railroad, I learn how to braid into your hair a map to freedom. As a mother, I'm terrified for my black babies, not because of any specific ill intent against them, but because so many people aren't willing to do the uncomfortable work of unearthing their bias and actively working to change their own minds. So when it's my son or my daughter's life on the line, will you have done the work? Will you have taught it to your children? To you, America may whisper tales of freedom, liberty, or the dreams within your reach. She sings the anthems of personal destiny to her chosen sons and daughters. I know these songs. I've heard them since the day I was born, covered from downy head to toe with my birthright, white privilege in a world built for me. But when you have a family that looks like mine, it's only a matter of time until your son is in the kindergarten lunch line and has to hear, white people are better than brown people. 
or until you're walking hand in hand with your daughter to the park and she asks when her skin will turn white like yours, then turns brokenhearted at the answer. See, America doesn't sing the same songs to my black babies, and they have rules that don't apply to me. Where standing for justice can get you cut down, and where even if you do everything right, you still have to live in fear of getting caught on the jagged edge of someone's split-second judgment. So, if you're white like me, what can you do? You can be the village. The one that shouts for joy, parades my children through its streets, really sees them for who they are, not who you suspect they might be. The village knows that my son has a wit so quick, it's two beats before you can even think to laugh. Or that we call my daughter Sparkly, because she walks into each room expecting everyone to love her, and so they do. <laughs> I need you to be that village, so that when my son outgrows adorable, or when other black boys are mistaken for bigger, stronger, scarier than they are, when someone thinks they have a right to my daughter's hair or another black girl's body, that you would stand up, speak out, because you see them and you know them and you can stand between them and an assumption or a fist or a gun. You can be the village by letting go of the America you knew and acknowledging that woven into the fabric of our founding and swirling in the air we breathe is the inalienable lie that white people are better than brown people. You could listen to the protests and believe their stories. You could seek to be a student willing to follow the lead of gracious teachers of color. You could tune your mind to the frequency of your own bias in order to fight it. You could admit that when you turn away because this is all too overwhelming, that's a white privilege too. You could be more than an ally. You could risk something and be an accomplice in the radical act of demanding that the system sees our black brothers and sisters as fully human. And when you do, I think you'll find that you've freed yourself from something too. I want my son's obituary to read, age 94. Beloved husband, father, grandfather, pillar of his community. He made a few mistakes, but lived a full life. He was preceded in death by his mother. Please, I want him to survive. Thank you. <laughs>